Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We have a fun episode lined up for you tonight. There was a Twitter slash X thread that came across my feed a few weeks ago now at the beginning of September, and it had a picture of one of the Disney cartoons, and I can't remember which cartoon this is, but it had a bunch of swords pointing at the character from the movie. And the tweet was, what's your unpopular cybersecurity opinion that gets a reaction like this? So what opinion you might have that gets a bunch of swords pointed at you that is unpopular. And so I thought it'd be fun to go through some of these start off with some of the more lighthearted ones and then go through some of the other ones, which I think uh, most of these I actually agree with, but you know, when they're said out loud or written down, it kind of hits home and you're like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Or maybe you don't agree with it, but either way, I think this would be fun to go through. So the first one I have is at Merrill, who is actually a Microsoft employee and his was microsoft enter id is a better name for azure active directory i agree with this one adam i think you probably agree with it too i think it is just a better name because it doesn't get confused with the on-prem active directory solution and it goes along with the branding and so yeah i i think that's a good one i fought people internally over this defending the new name picking on microsoft marketing is low-hanging fruit it's really easy and oftentimes they get naming wrong i think the recent process of doing brand names around different functional areas makes a ton of sense i love defender for all threat protection purview for collab um not collaboration purview for compliance priva for privacy viva for employee engagement entra for identity and i remember when i used to give presentations on Azure Active Directory. And the first thing I had to say is it's not just for Azure and it really has nothing to do with on-premises Active Directory. When you basically have to say the entire name is not relevant, it's a bad name. So yes, this is a better name. The next one I have is from at W Dorman and his was hackers is a pretty bad movie that falls short of achieving a so bad it's good status. I take issue with this this one <laughs> because I love hackers. So this is definitely an unpopular opinion in my in my world because I love hackers. I think it's a great movie. It is not a bad movie. It is not a so bad it's good movie. It's just a good movie in my opinion. <laughs> I have never seen hackers. I know. I feel oh, like now what? I have to go see it. Um, however, I am fond of talking about hacking the Gibson, which apparently is a thing from the movie. So yes. even though I've never seen it, there's concepts from it that have entered the lexicon that I regularly use. That was a, um, a, a popular phrase on the something awful forums like 20 years ago was, Oh, are you trying to hack the Gibson? And so ever since then I've always <laughs> used it. So for that alone, hackers gets a warm place in my heart, even though I haven't seen it yet. I'm shocked that. that you haven't seen it because you use that phrase all the time. So I just uh-huh. assume that you did. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. <laughs> all right. So the next one I have is from at IB rice one Oh one. If you work in cybersecurity, you need to have totally unrelated interests to ideally in arts or humanity, but anything really not just to stop fatigue and help you get through this life, but also for inspiration, both inside and outside your work to keep you well-rounded. I somewhat agree with this. I do have interests outside of cybersecurity, but I also am a tinkerer and I have interests not like outside of cybersecurity, but like within technical things that I like to do in my personal life, like build computers or run VMs and file shares. You know, I have a Plex server. I tinker around with different internet and um routers and and switches and stuff like that so 
I do get a healthy dose of that outside of my personal life, which also helps me advance my technical skills and acumen. But I also have completely unrelated things like skiing, snowboarding, mountain biking, and those sorts of things. So I somewhat agree, but I do think that you also need to tinker, in my opinion, to help you advance your technical skills. Agree completely with your take, Andy. I remember my first IT job, which was an internship with a very large Midwestern grocery chain. Um, and, and one of the folks I worked with was basically not a technologist outside of work and had great technical skills at work, understood things deeply, but his interests, like when, when it hit five o'clock, he turned off all the screens and he like went camping, you know, went hunting, went fishing, like did outdoorsy stuff was really almost rednecky in a sense, which was like bizarre to me because I thought, well, everyone in IT must love technology all the time. You go tinker with technology and you go mess around with it. Like that's what you do all the time. And I learned there are people that it's literally their day job. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. However, I agree with you, Andy, that I like technology period. And sometimes it really scratches that itch to try to do something maybe that's not designed to be that way or to try different ways of accomplishing something or just expanding your horizons. I think we have a great group chat with me and Andy and a couple other guys. And one thing I like about it is everyone in that thread is a bit of a tinkerer, whether it's home networking and all you guys are on the, what is it? Ubiquity stuff. And it's, I mean, that's tinkerer stuff for sure. And we have a guy in our thread who I think every six months goes back between Android and iOS. And is always like talking about his trials and tribulations, like whatever you do, being that kind of person that likes to take stuff apart and put it back together from a technology perspective makes you a better security practitioner because you're learning how stuff works, how it fits together and how to take it apart because that's what the bad guys are doing. So I agree. You absolutely need interest outside of this. This will destroy you if all you do is eat, breathe, live, sleep, cybersecurity. But at the same time, I think having adjacent technical interests is really valuable to advance in your career, which doesn't have to be cyber related. Just liking to tinker with technology is, I think, useful. The next one I have is from at Brian Haugley. And he says, you don't need to patch all vulnerabilities found. Patch exploitable ones and anything publicly facing, then place compensating controls on areas to lower overall risk. I definitely agree with this. This is something that I think a lot of maybe security leaders might not understand. And even some practitioners, because you see this list of vulnerabilities, like we just need to patch everything. But no, not everything affects you. You just need to patch the ones that affect you. And then the ones that are probably the worst ones, like remote code execution. Anything that's remote code execution, you probably need to patch that. If it's privilege escalation, most of the time it's not really that bad because you have to gain access to the endpoint before you can escalate privilege anyways. So, yeah, I definitely think this is one that is important. And when you read it out loud, you're like, I, I definitely agree with that. I didn't know this was an unpopular opinion <laughs> because where this one came to me is like, I thought that was a relatively accepted practice today. I will say, um, if you go read the standards to which Microsoft patches, its commercial cloud that you may use for office 365, Microsoft 365, this is actually like right in there that, you know, we'll patch high vulnerabilities within eight hours or whatever. And we'll patch medium vulnerabilities within seven days or whatever. And then, you know, low risk threats, we may never patch, or if we do, we'll, we'll patch it when we get around to it. You know, it's one of those, like you, you do that risk assessment, the, th the threat level of each vulnerability, and then you handle them appropriately. And some, again, like if they're not externally facing, if they don't represent major risk, if, you know, any one of those things, then maybe it's just not worth the effort or the risk of patching it. Because I think we certainly all have dealt with folks in IT who don't like to patch anything because, you know, there's risk involved and it's easier to keep the lights on if you don't touch anything and don't move anybody's cheese. But I, I, 
I didn't think this was unpopular. I thought this was common practice. I guess I still have a lot to learn because that's, that's how I thought everybody did it. But anyhow. All right. So the next one here is from hack Luke and he says the good guys are losing and we always will. And I kind of agree with this because we're always one step behind. It's a lot harder being a defender than it is being an attacker. But I think we're evolving. Every time there's a new attack, we have to pivot and change our defenses, patch that up, and then the attackers have to find a different way. And so is it always losing? I don't know. I, I think we are always a little bit behind the attackers just because they just need to find one vulnerability to get in. It is asymmetrical. And that will always be the case in the sense that there are going to be more people trying to break into your environment than you have people trying to protect your environment. That is an asymmetrical advantage they have. That doesn't mean we can't do things to potentially turn the tables, more automation, more artificial intelligence. Andy, you talked about kind of learning new strategies. If you look at how this conversation has evolved over time, we used to be hyper-focused on protection. If you think of cybersecurity as protect, detect, respond, we are hyper-focused on protection and not really good at detect or respond. And I see that as maturing over time that we've gotten a lot better at detect and respond, and there's more work to do there. But when we talk about things like zero trust, assume breach, changing our approach is, okay, you may get in, but we're going to have defense in depth that prevents you from getting very far. We're going to limit that blast radius. We're going to limit your dwell time. Those are all things that help us kind of acknowledge this reality that it's an asymmetrical fight, that there are more resources, more people, more everything on the attack side than the defense side. But that doesn't mean we can't have some practices that work pretty well. I do think um, it's a really good point. I think it's, it should be, it's an opinion that needs to become more popular. And we need to all adopt that mindset along with that assumed breach mindset with that zero trust network architecture approach is... We, we, we are definitely on the short side on resources. So how can we plan appropriately and, and de defend ourselves anyway? Next one is from at WBM 312, which is Whitney Merrill. She's a very popular privacy advocate and lawyer. She says being an infosec and or security does not make you qualified or an expert in privacy. Wholly agree. <laughs> they are often related privacy and information security. And there's what I look at like a Venn diagram of overlapping concepts, but privacy is it's wholly different topic. It's completely different thing. Oftentimes within organizations, you have a privacy lead completely different from compliance, completely different from information security. So I'm by no means an expert in privacy. I, am interested in it and i feel like i respect the folks who are experts in that area but yeah being in information security does not qualify me sit in a gdpr conversation for 10 minutes and your head will spin in a hurry it's a fully different practice the thing i always like to point out is google as an example has excellent security if you think of the security of gmail accounts of the google identity of your Google search history. I can't ever remember a time in which they had had a security incident where any of that was remotely close to being compromised. Google is not very privacy centric as a company. They love harvesting your data and using it in ways for them to make money. Uh, still something like 80% of their revenues are generated from advertising. Um, so Google's a great security company. They're not a great privacy company, right? And so you can kind of see how they're related. There's they're adjacent to each other, but yeah, completely different practices. So yes, just because you're an infosec professional does not make you qualified in privacy. Completely agree. The next one is from at Leonardo QM. And he says every single security professional should learn the basics. 
there's quite a few people being parachuted into security that are never required to learn the basics but still represent security to the organization and are seen as SMEs when they're not prepared to do so. This one is closely related to friend of the show, Christina Morillo's, and she's at Divine Tech Girl on Twitter slash X. Her says real cybersecurity roles require technical acumen and are not entry level. That is definitely an unpopular opinion. I also agree with both of these. I think you do need to know a lot of the basics of just IT in general, how things work, how organizations are set up, how enterprises run IT in general. And I don't believe there are entry level. Now, there are maybe some roles that if you're just like a ticket person or you have a system where you're just triaging alerts and then escalating to someone more technical, like we just need someone to kind of look at these real quick and and escalate them. Maybe those could be entry level, but for the most part, you need to have some basics in IT before you get into cybersecurity. Andy and I on this show have come out many times against gatekeeping mentality in cybersecurity. We are not fans of it at all. We want to root it out wherever we can. However, I agree with both of these as well. And I think we've articulated on this show, your career path is to get, do something in IT, do something in technology, do something in enterprise technology and start to understand how all the pieces fit together. And once you have that foundational learning, then you're ready to probably make that pivot into an entry level cybersecurity role, which is not overall entry level. Like you can't do that just straight out of college with no experience. Generally speaking, I think you got to get some understanding of, of how it all works together before you can really be effective at it. And Andy's right. You could probably dream up roles that wouldn't necessarily require that foundational level of knowledge. However, those roles probably don't have as clear of a career path and may be more dead ended because they're really repetitive roles that don't have a way to really grow in the role or demonstrate additional skills. You're, you're kind of human based automation in some ways. So that's maybe not the, the right approach anyway. So yeah, I think absolutely understand the basics is really, really critical. If you don't, there, there are some things you have to know, and it's not gatekeeping, right? But you need to understand basic networking. What's an IP address before you can do a whole heck of a lot with it. So, yeah, agree. The next one is super interesting. I read this and I was like, this is something that I never really thought of. And this one's from at the grudge Q. He's a very popular cybersecurity hacker um, follow on Twitter slash X. He said, reporting a zero day to vendors results in more threat actors having access to those zero days. Contrary to popular belief, quote unquote, killing zero day does no such thing. The vulnerability will be exploited for years. And unfortunately, I do think this is true because when a zero day is reported, what happens is generally the vendor will patch it. Hopefully is the case that the vendor will patch it. But then many organizations are behind on their patching in general, their vulnerability management. And so it may take some organizations, you know, years to patch something and you'll have old machines with still, you know, old operating systems, old patch levels, and they'll be around for a very, very long time. So I I think this is not... Unfortunately, a something that um, is untrue. It's it's something that I think we've seen in practice. I'm really struggling to wrap my mind around this. I understand the concept expressed here, and I get this is share your unpopular opinion, not share a solution. But that's where my mind goes from here. I think the concept in question is that When you report a zero day, like you said, the vendor quietly researches it, creates a patch, then issues a patch and publicly acknowledges 
at a high level what it was. Now you can probably reverse engineer the patch to get a pretty good sense of what it's patching and kind of work backward from there along with, you know, the patch notes to say this fixed a vulnerability in Safari where a malformed address, blah, 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 right? What I don't get, and, and so I, I get that idea of with all that information, more threat actors can then go reverse engineer the threat, discover the zero day on their own independently, and now for all those unpatched systems out there in the world, now the threat actors have access to them. I get that concept, but what's the alternative? What's the better choice here? And I get that's not what this is for, yep. but I, I don't know if the alternative is better. If, if getting quietly exploited because the zero day hasn't been publicly disclosed, is that better? If you have, you know, tons and tons of zero days floating around there because we just decided as an industry we're not going to patch zero days anymore. Ultimately, I, I fail to see how that is better, even if in a vacuum with this overall concept does make sense. So this is a good one in the sense that it's a thinker mm -hmm. and make you think about it. But I know I have been on this show very, very vocal that I really loathe these groups that hoard zero days for malicious purposes like the NSO group. And I'm a big fan of responsible disclosure. So this challenge is I've got some cognitive dissonance going on here for sure. But I, I, I where I moved to is if you make a good point like this, which this is a good point. Now I want to talk to what's a better solution. And if there isn't one, then we still stay the course. So definitely Great one to point. make you think. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're spot on that the alternative wouldn't be any better and we still need to patch them. So I think we just need to do a better job of patching and vulnerability management. Yeah. I mean, I think that's where I, I eventually come out on is at the end of the day, what this is really saying is we still have major gaps in patching and vulnerability management and we need to get better at those things. I think just like we talked about earlier with coming to acceptance that the attackers have an asymmetrical advantage over defenders. Yep. So the next one is from Jake Williams. He's at malware Jake. It doesn't matter how technically capable you are. If you can't communicate your findings in language, your stakeholders can understand, which is also very similar to another one I found by Emma McCall at X Nymia. Soft skills, influencing skills, leadership skills, writing skills, communication skills, teaching skills, strategizing skills are more important than your technical skills once you reach a certain point, even in technical roles. And it happens after it, it often comes sooner than people think. And this one I wholeheartedly agree with. It's something that a lot of people don't really think about until they get to that point or maybe they get into a role and they think it's going to be technical and they don't understand that a lot of being a cybersecurity practitioner is how to influence your leadership to kind of go along with what you're trying to do to make the organization safer but also being able to communicate that in a language to understand i remember at my old job that I would try to write things for my boss and he would water it down in a really good way so that he could communicate it to the board or to the C-suite because they don't have time or I really need to understand all the technical ins and outs. They just need a very small short blurb on what we're trying to do and how to make the organization safer. So this is something that I think everyone needs to work on. It's one of the hardest parts of our job is being able to communicate effectively and being able to convince or influence leadership to go along with our opinion. I think this is another frequently expressed opinion on this show. We have made the point many times that if you really want to advance your career, get better at writing, get better at persuasion, get better at communicating, get better at speaking all of the things expressed in these two tweets, really, really valuable. And at the end of the day, 
your job is to express in terms your stakeholders can understand what's the risk here. And if they choose not to spend their money on it, that's their choice. They're running the, the business, the organization. They're going to accept some risks. Your job is to help them truly understand what those risks are. So I always see, I think a good litmus test for like maturity in this space is do your executives accept more security or less security than your run of the mill employees? Because at a lot of organizations traditionally, and I think this is shifting, it used to be, well, my executives, you know, we accept them from like the MFA policy and we do this and we do that. And the executives should have more security. Obviously, we all understand that. If you can't articulate the risk to them of doing that, then you get in that position. So, um, yeah, I, I think great point from Jake and um, the other gal who shared this as well. Those two tweets are definitely related. Um, I don't know if that's an unpopular opinion, though. I think it's kind of, you know, maybe for some folks, they, they want it to be where it only matters if you're a technical. And if you have great technical skills, you can get away with not having the rest of it. And I think ultimately, for, for most folks, that's not entirely true. You know, you, you've still got to be able to come to the table in other ways. And honestly, this is true of probably just about any job where there's going to be functions outside of your core job function that still matter. You know, if you can, you can think of different jobs in the world where the core function is this, but if you're not good at these things, then you won't be successful. So take like a athlete. An athlete could be great at their individual sport. You know, maybe they're a great major league baseball pitcher or they're a great quarterback. But if they're miserable to be around in the clubhouse or the locker room, they will find themselves running themselves out of the league because nobody wants them in there on their team. So being a team player, like in professional team sports, Turns out that matters too. not just being able to throw the ball really hard or be able to hit a receiver from 50 yards away. Um, and I can think in other, you know, functions as well that that matters, too. So, you know, no matter what you're looking at in life, I think you're going to have your core job function, but you're going to need these secondary and tertiary functions that you also have to be good at in order to truly advance your career. Another good one from Jake Williams at Malware Jake is on risk management. And it's funny because you just talked about leadership accepting risk. But I mm -hmm. think sometimes as security practitioners, when we try to influence them, they just always accept the risk and they're not really doing the things. And so Jake had one that said, if you just accept every identified risk, you're not doing risk management. And I think this one may come out of maybe frustration, having been a security practitioner, you're mm -hmm. trying to influence what the organization is doing and the org is just like, yeah, we understand, we'll accept it. So yeah, I think <laughs> this one is probably unpopular, but I think you are doing some sort of risk management if you even if you're accepting the risk because you're as long as you understand the risk that you're accepting. But um, I think sometimes as security practitioners, we get frustrated in general when our leadership just says, yeah, we get what you're trying to do. We either don't have the money or we don't want to make the change because it's going to be harder or it's it's going to ruin the process or there's going to be more barriers or whatever it is. And they just said, we're just going to accept the risk. So I saw this and that's why it influenced my previous response. But yes, this ties back to that communication piece. If you're an effective communicator, you should be able to articulate the level of risk. Now, speaking of which, something I've brought up on this show a lot recently has been the concern that the risk of like reputational damage, financial damage to companies has declined as major security incidents are becoming more commonplace. So I was just looking at something on like Wall Street Journal, CNBC, some financial reporting site, and they were talking about how the Clorox company had their stock drop precipitously after they announced their earnings because 
They had suffered a security incident that shut down their production for an extended period of time. And so not only did that just cost them in straight up, they didn't have product to sell, but now customers have switched to alternatives because the product they wanted wasn't on the shelf. And now they're going to have to spend even more money once production is fully ramped up again to get them to come back to the company. And so the costs here were unbelievable. And so as much as I've gone on saying like, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe we're past the point where wall street cares. Well, let me, let me just come on and say, wall street still cares a heck of a lot. So there, that's an example where you can point to as you're trying to articulate risk and either get them to accept the risk or not of saying, Hey, you know, if, if we don't take care of this, there's a chance this happens and you know, we could wind up here. Um, and I, I, again, that requires you to have all these skills. You need to have at least some business acumen. You need to have some financial acumen. You need to be able to understand operations and marketing and all of those associated costs. So you can articulate the risk of exactly what happened to the Clorox company happening to whomever you work for and the widgets they make. So, uh, I just thought that was really interesting because, and I wanted to acknowledge on this show that, Hey, you know, as much as I've been saying this and I've been lamenting it because I felt like that was going to lead to less investment in cybersecurity and more risk acceptance. I think that at least not that I celebrate what happened because it's terrible, but points out that this still matters. Securing our business still matters because there can be enormous consequences if we don't. All right, a couple more here. This one is definitely a hot take. This one from at D Cuthbert. You aren't that worthy of a zero day interaction. Calm yourself down and update like the rest of us. And I know it hurts, but yes, for the majority of organizations out there, you're probably not important enough for a zero day. But there are a few if you're working for major telecom companies or major tech companies, critical infrastructure. Yes, I think those would be definitely worthy of a zero day, but the majority of organizations probably are not. A zero interaction, zero day, no less, um, is what T. Cuthbert was talking about. And yeah, I mean, I think you have to take into account what is the probability? What are the likelihoods of this happening? So, I mean, ultimately, I don't know. I, I guess to me, like whenever I hear about some new hot vulnerability, zero day, whatever, I mean, my question is just like, what can I do to protect myself? What are those steps? And then go do them and then patch as soon as I can. I mean, past, past that, like stressing about it happening isn't going to do me a whole lot of good. And for a lot of these, you don't even know if you're hit anyway. Um, it has dawned, you know, it is dawned on me that I'm at greater risk for this than I used to be doing the show and, you know, working for a major tech company, um, for sure. And it, it is one of those things where I, I talked about like having executives have hardened security over your everyday em employees. I mean, that's, that's something you have to think about too, in terms of how they operate. Maybe they're not necessarily going to run their iPhone in lockdown mode, but a presidential candidate should. But again, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, like I, I see some people do the sky is falling thing, which I feel like would be exhausting in this industry because then the sky is falling every day. But at the same time, take it as seriously as you can, but just really focus on the, what you can do part. I think that's the best approach. So yeah, I agree with this. And I, I think my suggestion is just focus on what you can control. All right. So the final one from at North Vane, most orgs will never come close to getting zero trust, right? Because they lack the commitment and or knowledge to unpick their legacy networks. A lot of orgs have no idea how their environment and processes work today. I think this is also true. I've talked with many customers and I'll say something and I'm like, well, that's not zero trust. And they're like, yeah, we know. 
So like, I think the <laughs> zero trust concept is out there and they understand it, but it is very hard to implement in general. And I think a, a lot of orgs hit a wall and they have an exception or they just uh, accept the risk that something is going to happen and they don't patch that particular thing to make it more zero day ish. So yes, I do think many orgs, most orgs will never get to zero trust completely. The thing I see in enterprise IT a lot is people don't do things until they're pushed to do them. And so something I've had a front row seat to experience has been the lack of uptake in moving to windows devices that use a cloud based device identity. The, what used to be called Azure AD joint, it's now called Entra joint, but where the device identity is in the cloud, as opposed to tied back to an on-premises active directory installation. That clearly from an architecture perspective, doesn't make any sense to have a dependency to line of sight to a server that sits inside your DMZ in 2023 and almost 2024. That doesn't make sense. We all agree that architecture doesn't make sense. That's a dependency we don't want. That's technical debt, period. And yet I would say it's still probably 98 to 99% of enterprise devices, Windows devices in the world are still configured in that architecture. And I get a lot of pushback why, and honestly, most of it's FUD. And it's not even true. Be things like, well, I can't talk to on-premises stuff. Yes, you can. Go listen to our episode with Shannon Fritz about this. Well, you know, you still don't have all the GPOs I need. And be like, we're not, we're not, at, you know, we're not migrating more GPOs at this point. By the way, Andy and I both work for Microsoft, although not directly with endpoint management. Um, we're not still migrating GPOs at this point. What is, what's there is there, you know, you need to decide if you really need that or not. And if you really need it, there's other ways to accomplish it. But like, it's all of this, like, because they're not pushed to do it, this technical debt persists. And so with zero trust, very similar thing. There's no, nothing pushing you to move to a zero trust model. And I think, Again, just like customers will agree, like, absolutely, I would love to eliminate that dependency for line of sight to an on-premise system main controller. They say, absolutely, I'd love to be in a zero trust state. But then they're not really willing to take the steps to get there. Now, I don't think it's as hard as people make it out to be. And I'm not saying these, this, it's trivial because it's not trivial. It's a lot of work. But when I look at the operational model you really want to get to and the steps you have to take to get there... The cloud-based device identity actually is a pretty big step, I think, that's pretty important. Um, but then for the most part, to me, like to get to a zero trust state mostly revolves around take all of your your like internal applications and do like the micro VPN to them, whether that's Zscaler or um Entra private access or the old um Entra app proxy. Like there's, there's a number of ways to do it, but if you can basically take all your internal apps and put them, you know, behind a micro VPN and then just set up an architecture so that all of your clients just sit on the public internet, you've achieved a hell of a lot of what zero trust ultimately entails. Now there's more around the network side that I don't focus on as much. I'm more focused on like the client user experience, the app experience. Yeah. You should do more segmentation. You should do more of this, more of that. That might be more tricky, and I honestly don't have a good sense of how much work that is, but to me, it's basically get your clients right, and it's get your apps right. And if you can do those two things, you're well on your way to a zero trust network architecture. And to me, I don't see those as insurmountable, but what I do see is that orgs don't have anything pushing them off the cliff, making them jump and do it. And so they continue to just keep operating in the way they always have. And they keep really kind of patching that existing model where it's like, oh, well, we, we VPN in and we have unfettered access inside the corporate network. And we've run into all these challenges with um, not having line of sight to domain controllers, like during password changes and stuff like that. So you know how we can solve that? Yeah, let's move to enter train. No, we'll do an always on VPN. 
Like there's more engineering effort in maintaining the status quo than just ripping off the band aid. And so that's, I mean, that's enterprise like in a nutshell, right? Is you often get into that, that approach where we spend more engineering effort on maintaining the existing paradigm. And so I, unpopular opinion. Yeah, I, I agree with it conceptually. I think hopefully maybe it's just cause I'm, I'm an optimist. I think this level of work is actually manageable and I keep being optimistic that maybe it's like the year of the Linux desktop, which will never come. Maybe next year will be the year of like the intra join device when it just becomes too much technical debt to abide anymore. And maybe people just start waking up and being like, well, geez, you know, Microsoft could have ported every GPO on the planet years ago. If they wanted to, they're clearly not going to do it. So I need to move forward. And, and to be, clear like the reason why we're not doing that is because we've already moved everything over that makes sense in a modern world we're not moving stuff over because like there's gpos that are technical debt like you shouldn't implement them today so i need to get off my soapbox so we can wrap up the show but i i agree with this conceptually but i'm holding out hope and listeners and watchers and viewers prove me right that zero trust is still a thing and you're still aspiring to it and it's a journey, which whenever I say something's a journey, I feel like I'm on the bachelor, but you know, that's, it's, it's not something we're going to build in a day, but we are all endeavoring to head in that direction. Well, this was a fun episode to mm -hmm. go through. I will have all the links to each one of these opinions that we went through in our show notes. So you can go through it. They're credited all and that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching and listening as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any questions or comments about the show or future topics you want us to talk about. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.